this is Jess. Thanks for watching DITV. I'm here with Joel Sartori, a contributing photographer for National Geographic magazine and a fellow with the National Geographic Society. That's right. Joel, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Um, we enjoyed very much having you at the opening ceremonies here at DI. Tell me a little bit about what your experience has been since you've gotten here. I know that you didn't have a ton of background with Destination Imagination, but I'm sure you've seen some amazing things. I have. Well, it was pretty amazing seeing 16,000 screaming kids last night. That's probably the biggest crowd I'll ever speak to. I hope it is, anyway. <laughs> it was pretty impressive. It was really amazing when they turned the lights off, too, you know, when everybody was throwing around the glow wands. It was really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you do at National Geographic, mm -hmm. what some of the pictures are that you've taken, where you've gone in the world, what's been sort of your experience? Right. Well, Geographic sent me to every continent uh, in all 50 states, some of the states over and over again, to do stories on conservation. Um, it's not really enough to show the butterfly on a flower in nature photography. You got to show the the bulldozer coming into the meadow right behind the butterfly, you know, just to show threats. Um, I really like the pictures I shoot to go to work, meaning they, they make the world a better place. Maybe they bring to light some environmental wrong or, or a corporation that's done great things by the environment. I like to show that too. I just want the pictures to have more of a story to them or a group of pictures to tell more of a story to try to change things if I can or to or to reinforce really good behavior on the part of some individual or organization or nonprofit. That's kind of what I do. Talk to me a little bit about conservation education and mm -hmm. what we can do to get that more into our schools and how critical that really is. Well, I wish I knew how to get it into every school. Um, we don't really have that in my kids' school, to be honest with you. It's, it's super critical because the future of our species, of humans, really rides on saving the earth. Um, we're supposed to lose half of all species by 2100. Uh, it's really foolish to think we can do half of everything else to extinction and not have it come back to hit us very, very hard. That's really folly to think that way. So for me right now, it's kind of a race. I'm documenting as many species as I can in a project called the Photo Arc, which is photoarc.com, uh, to try to show the world what we have and to get people to care enough to save them. A lot of species are going, going to go extinct because we don't even know they exist or what their needs are. So that's where I come in. And that's, that's, I've been doing that about eight years. I'm about halfway done. I figure another 10, 15 years, I'll, I'll have most of the world's captive species. But I'm telling you, if you stop and look at what we, the other creatures we share the planet with, they're amazing and they're fascinating. They're, they're funny and they're, they're sad and they're malicious and they're, they're joyous and they're everything we are in a way, a lot of them. And it's just, it's critical that we realize these things keep us alive. Healthy forests regulate our climate. Healthy coral reefs provide us with fish to eat. Just basic things like that. I mean, I mean, we really need kids to think about that type of thing and getting that education into schools. In terms of environmental education, that is a great first step. There's no distractions in school. There's no TV. There's no smartphones. That's the place to really sink in with learning and that it's really, really critical. I wish people could see the world through my eyes and as I've traveled all over the world. Uh, to know that, you know, I'm not kidding really, this, I'm a witness, I'm a witness to this. And we have 7 billion people, you know, we're on our way to 10 billion people. That is a real train wreck when it comes to the impact on the environment. And if we don't save certain places as wilderness to help regulate climate, to help provide us with the food we need, uh, you know, these are things that are really going to take their toll. Really Tell me critical. a little bit about what are maybe some of the biggest threats? What should be at the top of our priority list as far as saving the environment? Carbon emissions are really a huge deal. Climate change is a giant deal. Um, we really have to get off of fossil fuels as fast as we can. We may already be past a tipping point. I mean, when we lose the, the ice caps, the polar ice caps in the summers, it's going to reverse what's called the albedo or the reflectivity of the Earth and absorb 80% of sunlight instead of reflect it. 80%, the Earth's going to get really hot really fast and it's going to change rainfall patterns. Uh, and the rainfall pattern shifting means that rain falls in a desert where there's no soil and no farmers to plant anything. And the rain quits coming to the areas where the farmers do know how to plant and harvest foods. That leads to starvation. So it's, it's carbon emissions are a huge, major, major deal. Um, we have to start thinking about more than the price at the pump. The other thing that people should really think about, in my opinion, are um, maintaining forests, especially rainforests. They're kind of the lungs of the world. 
They, they, they stabilize climate and they generate weather, they generate rainfall. And uh, acidifications of the oceans, which ties right into carbon emissions. Carbon emissions are turning the oceans more acidic, kills the coral reefs. Coral reefs are really critical for maintaining fish stocks. Those are big challenges, but they're not insurmountable. But I'm telling you, if it's business as usual, like we've been doing for the past hundred years, it's not gonna be pretty. And in these kids' lifetimes that we're seeing here at Destination Imagination. Wow. Yeah. So what can we do right now? What are maybe Great some question. of the initiatives that you have? What can the DI kids get involved right. with? What can we Great start question. right here at Global? Well, if, it depends on what people are interested in. There's lots of things people can do. For example, if kids really, really like endangered species or they just love animals, volunteering at a local zoo, or helping to fund a local zoo or just raising awareness at a local zoo, that's a great thing. And photoark.com can help direct kids to the right zoos for the species they see. They're all tied in underneath each picture of an animal is the place where we photographed it, what that zoo's doing. Um, beyond that, they don't have to be a voting age to vote. Kids don't. Every time a kid breaks out his or her purse or wallet, they are voting. They're saying to a retailer, I approve of what this is made of and how far away it was trucked to get to me and I want you to do it again and again and again. And that spending power is really, truly power to change the world, to save it or destroy it. That's a huge deal, how we spend our money, how much stuff we buy, must we buy it, what kind of car do we drive, there's a, there's a million things. Eating seasonally, uh, going vegetarian is a great way to save the earth, believe it or not, because it takes a lot less grain than meat does. Uh, not watering your lawn, believe it or not, and certainly not putting chemicals on a lawn. Those are big deals. Your lawn won't die. It may brown up in the summer, but it'll green up again when it rains. Um, oh, there's a million things. There's a thousand things a week people can do, besides recycling and making sure that they're driving the right kind of cars or that their parents aren't driving some gas-guzzling SUV just to drive around town for errands. I mean, there's a million things people can do, and it all counts. I, I saw a, um, a display at a zoo recently for um, an exhibit that had walrus and it said insulate your house save a walrus and you think well how does that work well because when you insulate your house you burn less fossil fuel to heat it and that's less carbon in the air the more carbon the less ice there is for walrus they have to have ice to rest on and to float over their clam beds you're saving walrus by insulating your home and driving your car less that's that's all true I mean we have to think about it all together all together so what people do at home matters the other thing I wanted to say is, if you try to save the whole world, it'll drive you insane, because the problems are very vast, very big. But what you can do is work on your own backyard. It doesn't have to be an environmental issue, it could be a social issue. Just something where you can, you can make some progress and you can say, hey, I did something. So you just need to work on your own backyard. You don't even necessarily have to save your own backyard, but if you're working on it, doing good things, at the end of your life, is that enough? Well, yes, absolutely. That is all any of us can do. We just do what we can, and that's something that everybody lives in a city or town now, just about, or in a part of the community. There are issues everywhere you go, some good, some bad. These are all things that can be worked on, all the way around. So there's no excuse for not doing anything. There's another old phrase that I can close with. Um, just because you can't do everything is no excuse for not doing anything. And that is so true. Very true. Well, thanks, Joel. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Some great tips for us, thanks, and I'm Jess. sure we'll listen. Thank you. Thanks for watching DITV.